chat chat one two. Hopefully you can uh, see that okay.
Good morning, everyone. Hello. Um, welcome to uh, session 143 on emerging cybersecurity trends um, or threats. Uh, my name is Chris Boyer from AT&T. I am uh, an assistant vice president for global public policy there, and I specialize in cybersecurity issues. Um, I'm here standing in for Jeff Brueggemann um, from AT&T, who could not make it today. Um, um, the purpose of this workshop is really to focus on emerging cybersecurity threats, um, in particular around issues such as mobile and cloud security and the, inter and the implications of that on internet governance. Um, and the discussion was really supposed to encompass a technical overview of some of the threats um, and also discuss proactive strategies and solutions um, for addressing emerging cybersecurity issues. Uh, I'm going to be uh, kicking this over to Robert Guerra from Citizen Lab to be the moderator of the panel. Um, and I guess uh, Robert will go and make introductions of our panelists. So thank you for coming this morning. So good morning, uh, everyone, and thank you for coming um, to the session uh, this morning. Um, it's the first session of the day, so I'm, I'm really delighted that the, the room is, is, um, is uh, full. Um, my interest in terms of how to organize the session for today is it's really meant as a conversation um, not only between the panelists that are here, to, for them to share their expertise and their specific uh, insight, um, but also to dialogue uh, with you in the audience, which um, I'm assuming that some of you are either incredibly interested in the topic, uh, maybe have some technical expertise, and have a conversation to see if there are some common elements of uh, coordination, collaboration, or if there's some gaps and possibly uh, some suggestions that can then be contributed back into the main session. Um, what I'm going to ask the um, panelists to do is I'm going to st um, start with a couple of questions that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask, maybe two or three questions, um, and I'll ask each of them to, to answer uh, in order. Um, take one round of if they have comments for each other, um, and then open up that very same question to, to the audience um, if they choose to or they wish to um, comment on the question or maybe pose a question to the panel. Uh, when I ask a question for the first time to the to the panelists, I'll ask them to just briefly say their name, their um, organizational um, affiliation, um, and um, the country that they're from. And I won't ask them to get too much into their bio. Um, that's online. We have 90 minutes, which can go very quickly. Um, so just a kind of talking um, about myself. So as, as mentioned, I'm Robert Guerra from from the Citizen Lab. Um, it is a um, research, um, a multi-disciplinary um, uh, research um, um, group at, at the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto, um, and we've been long um, talking about this, um, these issues. Um, and so what I'm maybe going to start um, with you, Patrick, um, and then we'll just go around this way. And um, in, in no particular order, I guess, and just from the conversation we had a little bit earlier, um, I'll maybe ask the panel first to talk about maybe some um, recent um, incidents um, that uh, may have come up and well, to, to briefly describe um, the incident, um, to talk about um, how there was some sort of coordination or identification of the problem, um, coordination around it, on, and then maybe any challenges going forward. So if you can do that in three to five minutes. Um, so go ahead, please. Thanks, Robert. Um, Patrick Jones uh, from ICANN security team, uh, based in the United States. Um, and so the, as uh, Robert mentioned, um, just in the last couple days, there's been an um, example of a cybersecurity threat with a, um, a hacking on the um, CCTLD for um, Qatar, so the uh, .QA's registry operations. Um, this follows a similar pattern to what's happened in the last um, few weeks um, with Malaysia. With Nick Costa Rica had the same type of um, hacking, and um, this is actually a continuation of a pattern that's been going on, um, particularly targeted at the country code community. Although I'm probably be, um, not speaking out of line to think that that type of activity is happening against others that are uh, operating networks and infrastructure in the um, domain name space. Um, that's really an example of um, two 
one of the two main types of threats that from um, an ICANN perspective we see threats against the operations of the domain name system, registries, registrars, um, infrastructure providers. Um, the other example, and I hope we get time to talk about it, is the um, threats that are um, leveraging the domain name system to uh, either have um, for some criminal purpose uh, for malicious content, malware, um, phishing. So those are, in short, I guess two examples of um, threats that we're seeing, threats against operations of the um, domain name system and um, threats leveraging the system. Yeah, since you still have uh, five minutes, th so that's the threat. So the issue is, for example, for the, the Qatar attack, can you just talk a little bit about that in terms of how did the community recognize that was happening and talk about something about the coordination and maybe challenges kind of going forward um, or is the issue never going to come back again? Um, yeah, so this is one where there seemed to be pretty quick coordination between the um, security incident response teams that uh, observed the attack happening, uh, reached out very quickly to um, either the QCERT or to the um, QA um, registry, registry operators. Uh, the, the registry operators were in contact with, with us and I'm sure with others, um, uh, you know, either asking for contacts to connect them with uh, parties that they didn't have contact information for. So we were able to put them in contact with um, other operators who could help and um, that was appreciated. And we, we see that a lot where um, in, in an attack, they, either a registry or registrar um, may need to reach out to someone um, not in their country that uh, operates another part of the infrastructure and they would come to ICANN or come to FIRST or some other um, CERT team and that team will connect them with someone else who can help. And I, that's a really good area, example of the types of um, list-based um, communication that are happening, um, collaboration at that level of the community. Okay, thank you. Bevel Wooding, uh, Packet Clearinghouse. Uh, I'm responsible for Caribbean outreach with Packet Clearinghouse, and uh, we work primarily, well, my work primarily involves um, assisting Caribbean governments in dealing with um, net infrastructure and cybersecurity issues. Uh, the threats that we see in the region generally tend to revolve around financial services organizations and government online services. Um, the interesting thing about these these attacks are that they, they pretty much mirror what you'd see in any other part of the world, the difference being the capacity to respond. And so over the past few years, there's been an increased I'd say, interest in the formation of cities in the region, but also an increased interest in building technical capacity. The region does not have a very strong um, history of sharing information concerning attacks. And so most of what um, is discovered is, um, is normally unofficial and so up to this point there has been limited official um, coordination of responses to um, cyber security incidents. Uh, this is changing with the uh, greater attention being put to it and also because um, of the greater financial impact these attacks are having on already fragile economies. Uh, so if I were to, to indicate the, um, the where things are at right now it is uh, movement toward strengthening the region's technical community and um, greater cooperation um, between the region and other parts of the world where um, cybersecurity capacity is already well developed. So I'll ask you a question, um, just as I did with, uh, with Patrick. Um, was there, a sp so you're saying that there have been a variety of um, financial services under attack and it's gotten better. Um, for those of folks that may not be as familiar, is there a specific case that stands out in terms of being um, kind of the largest attack that impacted the region, of, or are they all of the same intensity? Oh, the, the case that stands out actually, the, the financial services sector is, um, as you know, one of the, um, there's offshore banking in the region, there, um, there are a number of significant insurance and um, um, commercial bank interests in the region. The case of Santo actually is one involving the government of Grenada, uh, where uh, a threat uh, was issued, and 
and the government turned to, to the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, one of the organizations that we work with um, for assistance, and, and the CTU turned to Packet Clearinghouse. Uh, the, 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 the thing that stands out about it was the, the lack of understanding, even within the, the government, um, as to how to respond to the threat which came from outside, of course. There, there were no laws to apply. Um, there was no clear understanding of who to um, seek redress from and protection from, and we had to walk through um, with the government. We had to walk through um, a sequence of steps to identify where the threat came from and what was the best um, way to respond to it. That proved um, to be a pattern or model that we've since used to, to help other governments in the region understand um, why they need to, to pay particular attention to the issue. And the Caribbean has a very high, for example, mobile penetration rate. Most countries have greater than 100% mobile penetration. These devices connect to offices, they connect to, um, to, to services that are vulnerable to attack, and, and there, there is very little um, by way of protection of the devices or the access that they have to, um, to corporate databases and, and services. Uh, so these kinds of issues um, create linkages that allow us to, to highlight the importance, not just of protecting systems, but the importance of collaborating um, in the face of attacks and, um, and looking at uh, coordinated approaches to, to developing capacity. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Christine. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Christine Hopers. I am from CERT PR Brazil. Uh, CERT PR is one of the national teams in Brazil. Uh, we are maintained by NIC PR uh, from the Internet, Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. Uh, our work in Brazil is to coordinate and facilitate uh, the work of other teams. We have more than 30 teams established in Brazil, uh, some from government, some from private sector, several from the financial area. Uh, and I think from our perspective, we are a national team not focused on government networks. We are focused on the whole internet and what can make the internet as a whole in Brazil safer and more secure. So from our perspective, the biggest challenges are really the threats to end users and to end users' mobile devices and everything. And especially in Brazil, we still have a lot of things to do in digital inclusion. Our internet has been growing uh, rapidly in the past three to four years. And the government really gave a lot of incentive for people to have access to cheap devices like tablets and, and smartphones. So I think this will be a challenge for the next few years. But really, I think the major challenge is that, of course, uh, criminal organizations and attackers, they really go to what's easy to attack. And it's really easier to attack devices that are in the hands of people that don't have technical knowledge and that don't know how to secure their devices. So I think this is one of the challenges that a lot of national teams are discussing right now on, on how really to improve that security. And meanwhile, what most of the people are doing is how to really try to do some countermeasures or to mitigate some of the effects. And one of the examples we have in Brazil is the work we do together with the financial sector. We have a working group, and I think it would be similar to what people call an ISAC in the United States, but really it's a group that was created in 2004 when we started to see a lot of financial fraud uh, targeted to end users and related to malware, to phishing, and some other attacks. And really in that uh, working group, we have everyone focusing on what they could do better. Uh, we from CERT PR, we focused on getting contacts in other countries to getting ISPs to respond and to have a smaller window uh, of vulnerability for the end users. So it's, it's really to get shut down things and to really get uh, less victims possible and, and the financial sector it focuses into investigating what actually is defeating uh, their defenses and, and how to do investigations so we kind of separate and compartmentalize and try to get the best of all of us and I think one of the ways to go would be really how to improve that cooperation of course there's a lot of things that we cannot share that they don't share and we try our best to build some bridges between different communities that cannot so openly share information. I think that's also one of the challenges for the third community on how to maintain the trust that we built during the years 
and how to go forward helping communities and establishing bridges between communities that not necessarily will be able to share that much information. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Yuri Ito. I am from um, JPSAT. I'm a product of the Global Code Nation. Um, this is Christine. We are the National Start um, in Japan. <coughs> So um, our um, panelists mentioned <coughs> about the thread. So I would like to touch upon a little bit what that type of thread is impacting to the international collaboration um, for technical community and especially CERT um, collaboration. So we start um, seeing a lot of um, you know targeted attacks globally, and also. Um, increasing number of clearly um, national security um, motivated attacks such as you know, Stuxnet, Stuxnet and DDoS against government networks and um, banking systems uh, just as the, the panelists mentioned. Um, the other aspect that we see is the governments are now um, start discussing about these type of um, Things uh, with the cyber warfare, cyber conflict um, dialogue, and around the world, governments are start um, making accusations, taking sides on who's conducting attacks and who's creating risks, and um, managing cyberspace in the cybersecurity is quickly becoming to seen as a very competitive um, competition, seen as a so this competitive approach has actually started to create um, substantial challenges to a technical community and start community um, in pursuit, um, pursuit of international collaboration. The involvement of the national security organizations can potentially break down in trust in start and technical community if we were seen as an instrument of state-focused competition. Um, and as a result, it can, you know, become very hard to share information um, and then collaborate um, and remediate the threats such as, you know, botnet or politically motivated hacking, uh, for example. So the result may be a significant rise in cybersecurity risk level because of the lack of transparency and the collaboration at the technical and, um, you know, third level operational level. Um, so I think the involvement of the private sector is ever becoming ever, ever more important than ever because they are the, the parties, players who can do the incident response in real time and the information sharing in very agile manner. Um, but national security competition has also made it more difficult to those um, organizations to um, collaborate globally. So probably, you know, my suggestion um, could be, um, you know, we should really clearly separate the national security um, activities and the security operations for the technical cyber ecosystem, internet ecosystem, which is consisting the internet infrastructure be very, you know, making those infrastructure safer, cleaner, and secure is a very different work, and then we should be pretty um, clearly separate that, and those mixing of that um, agendas is, I see, a uh, big challenges, uh, risk to breaking into that collaboration, national collaboration. Great. Thank you. Maybe I'm going to do... Um, one more question um, to you all. Maybe if there's any questions or comments and then open it up to everyone. One thing, there's a common set of um, issues or concerns that I heard from everyone. So um, I'll, you know, what, what I know in two of the countries where you're from, you have two major sporting events um, coming up. One that's more distant in the future and you have, Christine, you have two of them. And so the question maybe that I'll ask everyone is, um, We've all you've all talked about maybe you, you were a little bit um, different um, theory, but more in terms of um, responding to 
uh, an attack or an incident that took place. Um, what do you see as being in the next six months, um, either because of a vulnerability, um, um, what's, some, what's an emerging event or incident that you see that the community is already starting to organize around to try to reduce the impact? So it's Patrick Jones. Um, I mean, you mentioned the upcoming um, World Cup uh, in um, Brazil. Before that is the Winter Olympic Games in, um, in Russia. And um, so that's an event that um, certainly um, attracts some attention. Uh, in the potential for cyber attacks. So what would be ICANN's role in, in trying to prepare for that? Well, from a preparation standpoint, there really isn't um, much of a role for ICANN other than to continue what we've always done, is maintaining open channels of communication with um, the, uh, the operators of infrastructure globally. Um, so in the case of um, Brazil, we have quite a bit of regular communication um, with the teams um, there, and uh, same with uh, um, the RU folks in Russia, and um, in that, that communication collaboration is going to continue. Um, another thing that you're going to continue to see is the there's an interest in technical training and engagement um, from now all through these um, events. So one of the things that ICANN does is um, try to set up um, DNSSEC training, a um, basic training for or engagement with law enforcement and with policymakers on basic DNS awareness. So trying to raise the level of education of um, how the domain name system is set up, what are the um, interactions, and who are some of the key players that policymakers and law enforcement should be aware of if they do see attacks, you know, if they need to reach out to either their um, local CCCLD or if they need to reach more globally to a registry registrar that's somewhere outside of the jurisdiction. So just making sure that there's open channels of communication. So in terms of the Caribbean region, is there um, something that, that, that you see that's hap that's might be happening over the next six months to a year that the community is, is preparing against or um, so I'm just curious what, what is something that you could speak about um, that, that you're preparing towards? Uh, no, not, nothing specifically. They, I think where things are at uh, simply requires the strengthening of internet infrastructure which is happening. Um, the strengthening of the technical community, which is also happening. So you have uh, the proliferation of internet exchange points, the location of root servers, um, and the centralization of that monitoring capability. I don't know if you've seen spoke about um, with the formation of more um, local and movement toward um, greater cooperation at the regional level with SIS. Um, we're also seeing the, uh, the development of the, the technical community in, in that um, you have the Caribbean network operators with Caribnog. You have work being done by the Caribbean Telecommunications Union to um, bring together government ministers and sensitize them to the um, the need for policy to match base with the the increasing threat. Uh, and those those are uh, current and ongoing activities. And uh, in, uh, around that, you have greater participation in forums like these, and the Caribbean is taking um, an increasing role in, in number one being present, but also to uh, to adjusting policy and perspectives as it relates to, uh, to participation in global policy formation. I think all of these steps will go well for um, for the region in terms of its capacity to protect its um, network resources and also in terms of its capacity to contribute to what the global security. Christine? Well, as you mentioned, the World Cup and the Olympics, and uh, we just had a little bit of a taste what that would be. I think it was a beta test phase for our uh, local regions was the Confederation Cup that happened uh, uh, this year. Uh, one of the things, uh, I think we are in a, a moment that we saw the, the biggest problem was denial of service and was not necessarily denial of service against uh, the Confederation Cup infrastructure, but was denial of service against any site that would be .gov.br. 
so it doesn't matter what you're doing uh, or if it was just a small city in a countryside or they would just try to take the side of the air. Uh, we would see a lot of people claiming hacktivism. Some of that could be, but a lot of things that we see technically, they're just botnets being used to DDoS and then someone on Twitter saying that, okay, let's do it. And what we would see is really not really people doing that. So from our perspective, we are in a very interesting time because the past events talking to people from Canada for the Winter Olympic Games or Germany, the World Cup, or even Africa, they didn't have uh, this whole momentum of hacktivism going on, so the NIOP service was not really that a big problem, but we saw that this is uh, really what's going on now. And talking about uh, cooperation, uh, I think just adding to what Yuri said, uh, we in Brazil are also very worried about having all this uh, think about national security, intelligence community, and search, and some countries mixing it up. And uh, I think happily in Brazil, things are getting very separated. CERT PR is tied to a not-for-profit, and we think about critical internet infrastructure for the country. Uh, there is a government CERT that is uh, taking care of government networks, <coughs> and we just had created uh, two years ago in Brazil, the Cyber Defense Center that is taking a toll more into the national security. For the major events for the World Cup, we are working in concert, we are having monthly meetings because we are in different cities, so uh, we actually made some arrangements to separate work and to try to help every team to do something different for us to achieve a goal. The cooperation among ourselves is really working well. And I think some of the challenges are really like some players in the private sector. Uh, there is not, it's not very clear for them what is cooperation, what is paying or charging for services, and what could be uh, something in the middle among like helping teams during a major event and not mixing that up with services they provide as a service provider. So I think that's a little mixed, but we are uh, doing a lot. We are cooperating and sharing resources and actually uh, sharing and, and breaking up the work among the three major teams that we have in Brazil. And I think it's that actually enhanced a lot of our cooperation, but we still compartmentalize a lot of information that only the Cyber Defense Center needs to know. Uh, we don't actually just jump into each other's uh, uh, area of work. So I think that is something that's working pretty well in Brazil right now. Thank you so much. So we haven't had the Olympic yet, um, but I'm sure we will have a significant preparation. I'm trying to make a ready, um, have to arrange uh, readiness level um, for that big event. But um, I can probably share, um, we experienced some, um, not through this you know, event, this type of uh, big event, but we um, experienced some um, large DDoS against, um, you know, uh, governments and um, critical service providers with uh, political um, motivation um, over the, you know, um, sensitive political sensitive issues um, sometimes trigger uh, large uh, DDoS or um, attacks against the country. And um, that time, it is always very useful to have a trust um, point of contact to the others. Um, I can share some of the um, collaboration, collaborative agreement between um, Japan and Korea and China, in which we experience a lot of um, hacking, you know, activities between three countries triggered by the political um, sensitive event. And that time, we'll make sure that the start point of contact, the technical point of contact, is going to be always connected, even though those politically difficult time, <coughs> we're always there and providing a very stable um, communication path. Um, so that really um, contribute as a part of the confidence building measures for 
a political、uh, policy layers when they even you know have a difficult time to communicate each other. The technical communities are always connected, and then also when technical community cannot handle the problem anymore, we make sure that we have an escalation path within each country so that the、um, policy layer can work.、Um, When we need them to start collaborating in、um, diplomatic level or political you know, policy level, so that type of collaboration arrangement is very useful to respond to. Great, thank you. So before I go to the floor, I'm maybe going to ask、uh, Ron Dieberg to maybe respond to some of the comments.、Um, and one thing that we haven't heard so much is maybe the the research community or the kind of NGO aspect.、Uh, To this. So if you can make a couple comments, and then I'll open it to the floor. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, everyone, for the、uh, really interesting comments.、Um, I have a couple of reactions. The, the first is,、um, as Robert mentioned, Citizen Lab is a research organization. We're independent of the private companies and governments.、Um, we try to remain impartial, and one of our、uh, major focuses is precisely on information controls around major events. This is a new area of activity. Uh, we put together a concept note、uh, that is meant to be a framework for our research moving forward, and I'd certainly、uh, be willing to share that with、uh, some of the people on this panel and others in the room,、uh, because we would、uh, greatly benefit by your insights and, and information and data that you might be able to share with us around events coming forward.、Um, we also just released this morning a、um, post that is meant to be a framing post、uh, of. Information controls during the IGF here in Bali, and so we've broken it down into a number of forthcoming posts. So we're looking at this event, IGF. It's unlikely that、um, there will be major attacks or disruptions during this type of event, but you never know. And so we're using it as a kind of litmus case.、Uh, one of the things that we do in terms of looking at events and information issues and disruptions around events is, and how we define controls. Is Not just DDoS attacks. It sounds to me like most of you are concerned primarily with DDoS.、Um, for example, we're concerned also with surveillance、uh, and content filtering. So during major events like the Olympics, like the World Cup,、um, uh, you often have a ratcheting up of surveillance. In the case of Sochi,、uh, we've had a series of posts that we've done in collaboration with Privacy International and、uh, Russian journalist Andrei Soldatov. Uh, that are published in the Guardian, looking at、uh, Sochi construction of a, essentially surveillance by design,、uh, which we feel will probably be exported to other、uh, areas like World Cups, Olympics, and so on.、Um, but also, you you have、uh, around events probably greater chance of targeted malware attacks,、uh, targeting specific individuals. So、uh, I'm wondering if、um, the panelists are interested in. Have optics into、uh, attacks other than DDoS, or if you're interested in things like content filtering around events. Because again, during events, you might have either a loosening of internet filtering, or as I think is a requirement of the IGF in, in the hosting agreement,、uh, the country has to provide unfiltered access. So the, the, the、uh, connection we're getting from this room right now is different than what the average Indonesian gets through Indonesian telecom. Uh, where there is filtering requirements put in place.、Um, the second set of questions I have is slightly different. I'm really interested in uh, what Yuri said about national security uh, uh, interests, uh, interventions becoming a major challenge for the type of cooperation that goes on around CERTs and other actors、uh, when it comes to remediating cybercrime and other issues.、Um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate a bit. Others on the panel, what specific challenges that presents, and how we might go about insulating, if that's even desirable,、uh, the type of informal networks of collaboration and cooperation that go on from those national security interests. Is it even possible?、Uh, how, if so, how do we go about doing that? Great set of questions. Maybe I'll start with you and. So、um, 
I think you know, I mentioned a little, you know, I mentioned a little bit of my um, in of my um, you know remarks, but I think the separation, I mean, separation of the national security, you know, um, activities on the cyberspace and a work to making um, internet ecosystem technically, you know, internet ecosystem cleaner, safer, uh, more, you know, focusing on the risk reduction um, type of activity should be separated. And, um, you know, th there should be some collaboration, but to pursuing the international collaboration, I think, um, It, it actually helps that the community is separated. Um, I also think that um, sort of the maybe you know I can share how we overcome these challenges at the AP. So I'm chairing the Asia Pacific Regional um, Community in Asia Pacific, um, and that's called AP. Sud. And those challenges we actually change that challenges to an opportunity. And how we did is, first of all, we provide, we'll, we'll turn our mission from the security to regional risk reduction. So first of all, we have a very common goal that we can, um, you know, we can share among all the members for beneficial, mutual beneficial benefit for all the parties using in cyberspace in Asia Pacific in long term, which is making the internet, making the cyberspace cleaner. I mean, what I mean is not content-wise, content-wise, but these ecosystems consisting of internet infrastructure, making them healthier and cleaner, removing botnets, um, cleaning up malware and removing botnets. Those are the very first steps that we can, you know, collaborate um, quickly, and that's, that's, that's beneficial for all. And having that type of common goal is make us really easy to start working and develop trust where there is little trust. So providing the point of contact is a part of the confidence building measures, changing that challenge to an opportunity, changing that mindset from the security to regional risk reduction, finding the common goals, that's probably um, uh, the, the success successful, you know, factor that uh, we made our community work very closely together now. Thank you. Christine? Well, um, just piling on what you said and then moving to your remarks on uh, the World Cup and, and content-wise, but uh, one of the things that there's been a lot of discussion in several third forums is, is really how uh, the change in some of the search affiliation is being affecting some of the trust of information that we are sharing. We had a few countries where their national teams were moved inside their intelligence community. So the first reaction is really, okay, we're not sharing information that openly anymore because we don't know where that information is going and what's being used for. So I think this is one very tangible example of how separating national security from technical challenges and from really uh, taking the internet to a safer place is a difference. Uh, and, and talking about like the World Cup uh, and, and the Conservation Cup and other cups, uh, targeted malware attacks, that it's, it's basically our daily thing that we are doing, we deal with that. Normally, we have had some of those attacks during the Confederation Cup. We probably are going to have more of those attacks. Uh, and actually, dealing with them was easier than dealing with DDoS. I think this is why I put DDoS as one of the examples, because actually it was easy. Well, in five minutes, we shut down the web server that was hosting the malware, and then we gave that information to one of the teams that was doing the malware analysis, and that's based more into end-user awareness, especially high-level users and managers and, and political people. So I think that all depends on any of the countries. And talking about, for example, content filtering, that is not in our radar because in Brazil all the internet is um, in the 
private sector. That's not going to change for the World Cup. It's not going to be an internet provided by the government, not administered by the government. Uh, we will have a bidding, and the, the telecommunication company that wins will do the security. So none of the certs would actually be doing on-site security. We would be doing instant response, and we would not have not even the cyber defense center or government cert, they would not have equipment or data centers or access to what is there. So basically it's the policy of the telecommunication company that is going to happen. And in Brazil there is no content filtering uh, working now and there is no plans of having that in the future, and not even for uh, the World Cup. That's a challenge because probably if you have one infected machine that will be propagating, you have problems with malware, but then we go to the whole thing that I said in the beginning, that's really how to deal with end users, how to we deal with end user devices, how to stop malware being so easy to deploy and so easy to install. That is, I think, a little bit more difficult. Search can work into the remediation part. The software industry should be working into having more resilient software and more best practice not to have so many vulnerabilities so that we can open a whole new can of worms about how to change the software industry. But I think we are doing what we can to help systems to uh, be detected easier when and, ch and rapidly when they're infected and ha trying to remediate, to disinfect them and to do something. And for sure for the World Cup that would be a challenge because everyone will be with a mobile device and then I think that we'll have a connectivity problem. We were thinking, okay, you have a stadium with 90,000 people inside and everybody wants to upload a picture to Instagram at that moment or put a video on Facebook or whatever. So that is one of the challenges that the people from the connectivity are having at the other side because there is no way, uh, there is no really uh, infrastructure to do that and to make that work. So that's another challenge, not from the security perspective, but for the networking perspective. Thank you. I just wanted to make a, a comment on the uh, taking up on the surveillance issue because it's, um, it's of course getting a lot of attention, particularly from um, organizations and governments that are curious to find out if they're being surveilled. And, um, and I agree it is one of the cyber cyber threats um, that are that's being faced in the region. The question, the question though is um, that is yet to be answered is um, how how can we know if we're being surveilled, and, um, and if so, to what extent and in which areas? Uh, the interesting fallout from that question being asked repeatedly over the last few months has been um, a far greater attention and interest by government in the underpinnings of the uh, internet infrastructure uh, within the region, which is a good thing. Um, it has brought much, much greater interest and investment in um, what does it take to protect our national infrastructure and what does it take to um, to ensure that there is not unauthorized um, surveillance on the networks. I just want to mention that as a, a significant uh, beneficial fallout from the, the current surveillance. Thank you. Patrick, and then we'll open up to the floor. So if, you, if you're trying to hold up um, the success of the, um, the multi-stakeholder system, and, um, the IGF, as an example, the technical community coming together with different communities. Um, the coordination and the collaboration that's done on in response to cyber threats and regular attacks is one that's it, it's a good story for the, this community to be bringing to governments and bringing to policymakers. Um, that it, 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 the strong point of this multi-stakeholder transnational process is that it brings together diverse groups that can share information and address challenges um, collectively better than groups can do on their own. And that's one of the things that um, you know, we've seen at ICANN, um, been trying to uh, talk quite a bit about thinking of security in a different context, uh, looking at it from a perspective of how can um, we use this multi-stakeholder process to foster a, a healthy, stable, um, sustainable, resilient internet ecosystem. And that this um, collaboration and this risk reduction example that Yuri mentioned, is just, it highlights how this model can bring together groups to do just that. Great, thank you. So just a moment before I open up to the floor, um, what I'm going to do is I'll 
take a couple of questions and comments at a time and then have the, the panel react. Um, as you're formulating a question, uh, I'd ask that you do one thing before you get to your question is in your point of view, um, what's an emerging threat that's of interest to you? Um, and then after you've stated that, um, you know, please post your, um, form, you know, ask your question or your comment. So are there any folks that wish to? So we have one, two, do I have a third somewhere, three, four. Well, just this, I just want to go around the room. So we had one, we had two, and then we had three, and then we'll get another three. And then I'll go back. So please, sir. So I'd ask um, your name, organization, country, what you see as an emerging threat, and then a question or comment for the panel. Thank you. Hello there. My name is Jonas Mäkinen. I'm from Finland, representing Electronic Frontier Finland. So yes, NGO. I have a more individual approach here. A lot of the cyber security, talk, security talks are about uh, very large issues, as in denial of services or or stopping or tracking financial services or governmental services. But uh, a very emergent issue has been, for example, that this year several hackers have shown that medical apparatus, for example, pacemakers or insulin pumps or several other medical equipment are in a threat of being hacked or cracked or broken. And this is uh, something that could now or in the future actually take individual lives at risk. So is, uh, are you aware of people or governments or your organization actually preparing for any sort of attacks like this instead of the very common and classic and usual DDoS and so on? So just hold that and we'll go number two, please. Um, you're, you're, again, identify yourself, what you see as an emerging issue and a common or question to the panel. Jean-Christophe Vigne from Dot Secure. French, but the company is a U.S. company. Uh, I guess it's more an ongoing threat than an emerging threat, possibly as a follow-up to the previous commenter. Uh, we see more and more issues happening because of the lack of follow-up from concerned organizations and companies like domain names that are not renewed or that are that have been um, secured through arbitration but not activated or certificates that are active but linked to a bad domain name. So my question, uh, someone before mentioned, I think it's Patrick, mentioned the importance of education. And I'd like to ask the panel, you know, very closer to home, very, the most basic issue of the user not taking the appropriate action when it's available. Do you, do you do something about that? Do you see that as a pattern in, you, in your country? Uh, because again, before tackling DDoS and botnet, uh, more often than not, the issue is a very single IT person with a computer not taking the right action. Great, and then we have number three. Good morning, my name is Gayatri from the Southeast Asian Press Alliance, uh, but from Malaysia. So I'm actually quite curious uh, about the example that Patrick mentioned about the attack in Malaysia. Would you be able to just share also the government response to that uh, attack? Um, but I think while it's true that there are so many other levels of attacks, but I think within Southeast Asia, the DDoS is actually probably one of the really big ones, uh, particularly with the media, um, those that are independent media, uh, smaller outlets or the ones that actually have rather good um, critical views um, and, and we see that happening sort of uh, on a regular basis always timed with the uh, key events uh, elections or conflicts so um, I think that's <coughs> an area that we still have to have a lot of uh, attention on how to actually work with the media but just curious about the relation so, so before we get to the panel um, I just uh, wanted reference I think it was in I don't know if it was the New York Times or the Washington Post over the last few days, this whole issue of kind of medical, uh, I think it was an episode of, uh, a TV episode of a TV series called Homeland where the vice president gets killed because um, someone basically turns off his pacemaker 
and then Dick Cheney, um, the former vice president, saying that he actually had the wireless functionality in his pacemaker turned off because he thought that that type of attack is possible. So um, it kind of shows that, but that's it, it, it's something that, that's quite real. So I, I, that's an interesting question. Um, and then I'll ask the, the rest to talk about kind of the, the issue of, of the user and how the problems with follow-up. And I guess um, getting to, to your point, um, something that may, may have not been mentioned that um, I'll make sure that people answer your, your question. Um, but I, I'd be interested also in hearing from the panel in terms of collaboration that may be taking place between um, the different technical community or maybe the companies to help less resourced actors like NGOs who do not have a sophisticated and robust um, DDoS mitigation strategy or technical capacity. Um, so I'd be interested to hear, um, I'm not sure whoever from the panel, Patrick, maybe you want to go first and then others, maybe I'll get another two who may want to comment. So please go ahead. So, I don't have a specific comment on the uh, attacks targeted at the individual level, um, but so regardless of whether the attack is focused at something that is um, at a high level denial of service attack or something um, more local, it, earlier I tried to divide the types of attacks that we're seeing from those that are targeted directly against the infrastructure the operation of registries and registrars themselves or um, ISPs versus the attacks that are leveraging the system trying to make them use the internet and internet infrastructure to deliver an attack out. And so um, in order for something like that to the, the example that you have raised, in order for it to work, it would need to use the domain system or the internet in a way that um, enables that to happen. So Lay it out that you know for that attack to happen, it only happens if the medical devices are connected to a network, and then the, the network can be exploited in a way that it enables that attack. Um, maybe why don't you go around the table and I can come back to the uh, sure. specific. Sure. So anyone else, please. Uh, we have seen, and I think it's just 
a disaster waiting to happen because we already had major problems with Pigeon Alter, that was I think the major case, but then we have another, uh, other uh, certificate authorities that were hacked, we have malwares today that actually used stolen digital certificates, so it's, it's really, we have, we have been putting a lot of trust in an infrastructure that it's, it's basically broken right now, so we need to think about that in the future, so it's one of the emerging threats, I think it's one of the latest threats that's been there, no one wants to look at it because it's too difficult. There's people proposing, there are some proposals about using DNSSEC together with SSL to make it more uh, strong, to make everyone to be able to have two ways of certifying that a certificate is okay, it's a little bit technical detail, but that's also a problem for the future. And one of the things that I think will, will tie uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more, I think, in the last panel on Thursday, but uh, when we are talking about DDoS attacks here, we are talking about effects, but if we need to think about why they are happening and they are being so effective, it's because it is way too easy to make a really big denial of service attack these days. And it's easy because we have too many vulnerable devices being affected by malware and too many poorly configured networks being abused to amplify attacks. So it is really about the responsibility of every network, every ISP, every company to configure their systems to not to be abused and of us all to try to get devices to be more secure, but it's not easy. It's everyone that has to teach their grandmother or mother or whatever or aunt or even the children to, you know, you have to do this and you have to install a patch and you have to do, I just want to use it. I don't want to be with all this hassle. So I think this really a challenge for the future. Okay, so maybe I'll take another, do you want to make any Robert, can I comment on the medical device? So it's Chris Boyer from at and I just want to make a quick comment on the medical devices issue. And I think what, what, really, what folks are really talking about there is what's commonly called the, um, like the Internet of Things or M2M -M type services. So medical devices are one example of that, but other examples are things like connected cars or connected power in your house, like your refrigerator and those types of things. And just, just to offer an industry perspective on that, um, there's a lot of work being done within the industry to try to develop standards to um, try to secure those types of services. That market is a, is a fairly nascent market. It's just coming out now. So I think some of the vulnerabilities you're seeing are kind of the nature of, you know, new services rolling out and, and some of these things just happen in, that, in, a, in a new environment like that. But um, speaking for industry, I think that there is, um, there's a lot of activity um, to try to ensure that that market can grow. And I think security becomes kind of a, a stake, um, really becomes a stake in the ground. Like people are not going to adopt those services if they don't feel at least some level of security. So I think that a lot of companies are working. There are groups that have just emerged, like 1M2M is the name of a, an organization that's just recently started in the last year. My company's a member of that, but there's over 230 some odd companies that's focusing on M2M -M standards, not just on security, but across the board. And when I think about um, those types of services, I really think there's multiple aspects to it. You have security at the device layer, so you have a lot of devices that are out there that are kind of static. You know, how do you secure the device layer? How do you just secure the transport layer between the device and the network? And then, and then you have the cloud itself. How do you secure the application, most of which reside in the cloud? And so there's other groups like the Cloud Security Alliance that's been working on you know, cloud standards. So my main point is that there's a lot of activity in the, in the industry side to try to um, come up with um, standards, both on security and other aspects of end to end. Great, thanks. And before that, I just wanted to check before we do that. Um, this session is also being live streamed, so I'm just curious, is there any comments from our virtual participants? Is anyone able to, to tell me? Please. So I was looking at the live web stream, but I didn't see anybody. Okay. So I just wanted to go around now, so three to five. So we've got um, one, two, and then three. So, please. I'm sorry. Do you, want to, do you want to make a comment now, please? Um, so, you mentioned the industry efforts on the control system and medical devices and device level. Um, I agree. I see that um, from the threat perspective. We start handling the vulnerabilities on the um, healthcare medical devices as well. Um, the vendors in the industry. Um, talked a little bit about the individual and um, 
IT system uh, 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 sort of the minimum, you know, one-on-one -on -one cyber hygiene, improving the level of the um, cyber hygiene. I think that's important, and um, you know, to really encourage that, I think the, the important thing is we start, you know, we start working with the people's mindset changing from, you know, you are updating your operation system not because not just because it's protecting you, but, you know, not to be a part of the, preventing yourself to be a part of the attack infrastructure. So in a healthcare you know, model, you're washing your hands, not to get flu, but at the same time, you're not, what you know, you are washing hands not to spread the flu to the others. So that's the same sort of a mindset, you know, what we're doing is not only, you know, your security, but the others. We are all connected, so that type of um, you know mindset probably um, important. And the last point to um, on that um, how to accelerate the multi-stakeholder collaboration. I think one of the things that we do not have we're missing at the cybersecurity um, uh, to be doing the goals um, is we do not have a strong data source. Um, to um, you know, robust enough and cross comparable um, to develop the statistics to measure the cybersecurity risk globally and nationally, and I think that's um, you know very important and essential for these metrics and the you know risk measurement. These are essential for the policymakers to evaluate the potential security approaches, and also for the technical community. It's you know useful to prioritize the challenges. And um, you know, manage the very limited resource that the you know, community has. So I think these are something that we need to, you know, look and can learn from um, other international collaborations, such as like a public healthcare um, domain, how they are using the layers of metrics to drive the policy and um, drive the international collaboration. Great, thank you so very much. So we had, there was one, three, and where was two? All right, so please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Dennis Poeders. Um, I'm from the Netherlands. I work for a policy think tank called the Scientific Council for Government Policy and also work for Erasmus University in Rotterdam, so I'm sort of government and academia. Um, I have a question for uh, Yuri Ito, but it was also like other people's, uh, people on the panel uh, to invite him to respond. Um, I really like the point you made about uh, separating new gen for which would also be safeguarding the technical ecosystem, and on the other hand, the issue of national security. Um, I have two questions about that. Well, one, what do you think is the trend? What do you see? Because usually when people talk about national security, things tend to expand and things tend to get sucked into what is called national security. So what do you see as a trend? And the other thing which I thought was really interesting is this, this interacts with trust. Um, so who's trust? And what do you see happening there? And also, um, uh, yeah, could you give us an indication where do you see trust waning or changing? And maybe one small note on DigiNotar, because people were talking about it from the Netherlands. When I speak to a lot of people uh, in the security, the cybersecurity uh, community in the Netherlands, they are now talking about DigiNotar and certificates as as a vital infrastructure. So, so they're changing sort of a perspective, sort of with with the with the, the thing in the background. That who knew? Who thought that this would be a vital infrastructure? But apparently, it is. So that's just a comment. Yeah. So, so hold on the answer. So number two, please. Hello, my name is Dr. John Selby from Macquarie University in Australia, from the academic community. My um, emerging threat. Uh, it relates to the change in the motivation by security researchers, which has emerged through economic forces. Uh, historically, they would, if they identified a zero-day threat, reported to the developer of the software. But we've seen the rise of brokers who are now offering significant amounts of money, funded by sometimes national security agencies, other times by criminal organisations. To those security researchers, in return for handing over the exploit um, and on selling it rather than reporting it. So I'm interested in how you 
idea of the emergence of these brokers and the, what you're seeing them having, or their activities having a significant impact on your organizations. That's a great question. Thank you. Number three. Alex Komninos, uh, Civil Society uh, from the Association for Progressive Communications, as well as um, academic um, from uh, University of Gießen, Germany. Uh, asking this question with my uh, netters and hack, the all, uh, hat, the all-encompassing stakeholder group. Um, I, I also really like how Yuri Ito has fleshed out the kind of dynamics between national security um, and, and what happens, yeah, uh, as was pointed out by, by the previous gentleman, so, so, so thank you for pointing out the dynamics between safeguarding the internet and national security. Um, I'm concerned about uh, when um, uh, uh, cyber security issues become securitized uh, and thus kind of move up in importance, become national security issues. I'm, I'm concerned where civil society and netizens are there. And I'm also concerned about the militarization of cyberspace. So recently the Japanese government has declared cyberspace a military domain and a, um, there's also been the development of, uh, well I've read this in some reports of a defensive malware, uh, which sounds a bit of an oxymoron to me. Um, I'm just wondering uh, what you think that does to the relationship between safeguarding the infrastructure of the internet and national security and trust, um, whether this is going to be good or bad. Thank you. So we had the three questions. I'll may let you maybe start because a lot of them were, were focused to you and then if there are yeah, other panelists wish to um, comment or respond, um, please let me know after you is done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think the trend is yes, um, a lot of national sorts are, I mean, the cybersecurity is becoming a public safety, major public safety and national security issues. So, you know, naturally, the national sorts um, were supplanted by government. Um, so that's, that's, there's certainly trends there. Um, the trust trust between the, you know, third of the technical community was you are, you share the information, you know, vulnerabilities, threat characteristics, um, you know, um, attack characteristics, and then, you know, trusting that is going to be used for securing the infrastructure and the coordination is really to make the network working. Um, globally, but now if you know you are seeing, you know what you are sharing is going to use for military perspective or security focused, national security um, focused activities, then it is making um, a start to collaborate those information um, easily. So uh, that's the breaking trust part that uh, we worried about. Neutralization is, you know, a hard part. Uh, I think that really destabilized the you know, cyberspace, but we can't really stop it um, at the moment. It's out there starting. Um, so from the third community, what we can do is at least to provide a trust, stable point of contact for instant response or even a crisis uh, response point of contact. Um, to actually, you know, contribute to, uh, for the risk reduction to the region. Any other panelists? And you, anyone else? Comments? Are you going to work on it? Okay, so I'd like to Christine. Yes, yeah, I'd like to make a comment. You mentioned Dijinota. We've been following uh, the Dijinota case uh, since the beginning. Uh, every year we go to the later, to the former Gobster to now and our MCSC conference. Uh, this year we invited Art Jochen from MCSC to present in our event in Brazil as a keynote about the Dijinota case. And one of the things, uh, as you mentioned, that most of the people in the Netherlands didn't talk about our digital certificate as something critical. And it's because 
works. People don't know how it works. And people don't realize that they're putting all the eggs in the same basket. And I think what's happening now, and when I said it, uh, the whole digital certificate area, it's just a disaster waiting to, to happen because nobody actually understands how easy it is these days to have uh, or to steal a certificate or to issue a digital certificate in uh, a certificate of authority and how that would actually impact all the e-government services, all the uh, commercial services and everything else. And I think the Netherlands was a big case because actually the whole society it really uses the internet and uses the, the information. So uh, this is one of the points. The community needs to move forward, not to really to rely on only one technology for security. I think this is a major problem. A lot of people from the technical community, myself, I gave a lot of speeches to people, say, oh, we just need to use digital certificates and everything will be secure. And then I said, okay, don't do that. Like in Brazil, we were doing pitches because they wanted to put in the legislation that you have to use digital certificates as the only trust measure that said, okay, don't do it, That that's really stupid, you know. And thank God that law didn't pass and we are not obliged to rely on, on really a technology and we have another problems with, with all the technologies. And I think um, another issue, not only about national security, but it's that most of people that don't really understand how actually things work on the internet, they come up with like bad ideas for legislation, bad ideas for whatever you can imagine because they relate to the day-to-day -day world and it's not exactly the same. There is no easy metaphor to our world today and, and how things would apply to the internet. And we've been dealing a lot with the Brazilian Congress, with Brazilian legislation and everything. And basically I think that's probably happening in all countries because um, suddenly the government and the society, they realize that the internet is too critical and we are depending on the internet for commerce, for e-government services, and nobody actually paid attention to security. So I think there is a lot of overreaction into that, and, and that is the point that can be a little bit dangerous, because then the first idea that come up, it's just taken as the best idea that would be. So uh, I think for anyone that wants to learn more, like the reports from Diginoter are open, and I think that is one of the major things with the Diginoter case, that you have a report, it's open to the public, it's a case study that anyone can study. It's not really like the other cases that are just secrets that people are just putting under the rug, just not to talk about it, because the problem is too big for us to talk about it. So, And, and just as a comment for the cyber war thing that came up, and um, I really see, as we are seeing the criminal, uh, the organized crime go into the internet, everybody is using the so, of course, it's, it's, uh, if internet is so important, it just goes to, to be a, a war area or something to be used uh, for war, like you have any other thing, the space, the sea, the land, and, and whatever. So, and I think this is, is very new, and it's just like you also have like this ripple effect that one country says it's doing so, the other country say, okay, we need to do also because we don't need, we, we can't just be the ones not doing it. So um, I'm still kind of waiting. I hope it doesn't go to that land. But uh, I think really something that probably we have to, to deal in the future uh, with that. And we are seeing a lot of gossip about like the zero day market, that actually we have governments buying zero days to like create this weapon cash or something like that. So um, are things just coming up? And, and really it's, it's one of the challenges that go back to we have software that's that vulnerable, you have zero days coming up all the time, and now that you have a financial incentive for people to look for that and to actually sell it and make money, and then you all have the market just going on. I think it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing to observe in the next few years, and I would urge everyone here that has a contact with people that are dealing with decisions in this area to actually provide like some technical background, some sound information, and some advice and you know, what are the dangers of going to one way or the other and, and really what's possible or not. So that's it. Yeah, so real quick, I wanted to go back to the Malaysia question. Um, we didn't have time to get to it earlier. And I don't know what the government reaction was, but I do know that the um, attack against 
and the MYNIC, the operators of the MYCCTLD, um, were, they were very quick to coordinate with the impacted um, landowners whose websites were defaced. So um, Google, Yahoo, um, they're, they're, you know, the, it's the same group that tends to be targeted in many of these um, hackings. So all those groups were uh, in quite close collaboration with MyNIC uh, and were able to um, have the websites um, reversed back into the um, previous condition very quickly. Uh, it would be good to know what level of coordination the operators have with the government, but I don't know. I mean, that, that's, um, that's for the CCTLD. Um, so I don't know if that um, gives you a place to go look, but um, so I just wanted to come back and answer that. Uh, on the DigiNodor example, so this is a good example of the Certificate Authority um, community, the Certificate Authority browser forum, other groups that um, convening for, um, function for uh, the certificate authority issues are starting to um, wake up to their role in the ecosystem. We've um, had representatives from the CA browser forum come to ICANN meetings recently, um, become a lot more active in um, policy development or at least providing input. Um, so we are seeing, at least from, from the technical standpoint of where I sit, I, the collaboration and engagement with those folks is uh, increasing, and that's good. Um, I'll leave it to you. Yeah. So, Ron, you wanted to, to comment? Just a comment, actually. It, and it comes from you know my background. I'm an international relations professor, and I'm struck just listening to the uh, observations that are being made here about some of the trends that uh, we're seeing a dynamic that uh, you know would be predictable to international relations theorists like myself. Uh, known as the security dilemma logic. So as cyberspace is becoming securitized, it's becoming more and more critical to everything we do. Obviously, it's become a national security issue. Um, but what we're seeing, uh, perhaps an unintended consequence of that, is exactly what's being described here. Uh, trust is being eroded in this, what I would call a kind of epistemic community that used to operate more or less informally and in a kind of fluid manner without much formal accountability. Uh, between engineers, law enforcement, sometimes even national security. Well, now that national security issues are more important, uh, that trust is breaking down. You said break, trust is breaking, is the way you describe it. I think it's very potent. Um, and of course it is, because certs are being gradually drawn into national security interests and dynamics, and this is eroding that community. Uh, and it's also being compounded by an arms race in cyberspace as governments stand up offensive capabilities, as Alex described, well, Japan is just one example that's happening all over the place, right? And, and that's feeding into uh, and actually being uh, uh, buttressed by this uh, market for zero-day attacks and, and products and services that provide the very things we're trying to protect against, which if you look at them, it's actually the commercialization of cybercrime trade crime. It's now being packaged in brochures and sold to governments very things that you all are trying to work against. Your own governments, in some cases, are purchasing and using against your networks and you're trying to protect. So we have an arms race dynamic internationally. In many ways, I think we need to look at uh, the situation in, in the 50s and, and people predicted around the nuclear era that there would be, uh, very quickly, dozens of governments that would have nuclear weapons. But that didn't actually pan out. And the reason it didn't pan out is because of the efforts of the broad arms control regime. Um, people don't like to talk about arms control in cyberspace. It's usually dismissed because information code can't be controlled in the same manner that weapons can, what, uh, that traditional weapons can be. But I think we need to revisit that argument and look at arms control regimes in terms of controlling behavior, uh, in some cases controlling companies. We can regulate uh, some of the zero-day market uh, much more effectively than is being done now. Um, and I think that really needs to be explored uh, unless we're going to see this whole thing lead greater into a greater whole of balkanization. Um, one last uh, comment. If you see the post that we put up today about information controls around Indonesia, we'll just point out that there are command and control servers we found in our scan 
or Fins Buy, one of the very products we're talking about here in Indonesia. So with questions from the audience and with uh, a little over five minutes left, I think what I'll do is I'll have maybe um, a set of questions for the panel to answer as kind of a way to, to wrap up. Um, and it will segue a little bit well in terms of what you mentioned, Ron. So it's kind of two questions, um, but it's kind of a questions kind of plus. So my two questions is, um, what do you see the role of either regulations or frameworks to help the issues of, of emerging cybersecurity threats? So that's number one. And second is, if, if you could make two recommendations to stakeholders at the IGF, I wouldn't say recommendations to the IGF because the IGF is not supposed to produce any recommendations, so it's recommendations to the stakeholders. And you can pick whichever ones, uh, whether it's one or all, um, all of them. So again, what, what do you envision? Um, regulation frameworks, would that be helpful or, or not? And two recommendations um, that, that you maybe have mentioned already or do you would like to make to the, to the community that's here in the larger um, IGF. I will start with you, Patrick. Sure. So I don't have observations on regulation frameworks because I don't think it's helpful to try to regulate in to a particular technology when the rapid pace of change you may make those regulations um, you know, move. Um, so what I'd rather do is um, give some feedback to stakeholders at the IGF. Uh, so earlier I, I said um, if you're looking for a, a model or an example of how the multi-stakeholder model works effectively, um, the types of collaboration that is being done to address um, cybersecurity threats is a really good example to explain to your government or to um, regulators, policymakers, that you want to see how the multi-stakeholder model can work, see how these groups are getting together to address um, the cybersecurity challenges and, and threats of the day. Thank you. Please. Uh, on, on the matter of the, the regulation, I, I would um, be more inclined to look at, at general best practices being promoted um, within country and within regions as opposed to out and out regulation. Um, as it relates to the recommendations, um, I think more dialogue can only help and uh, the more the, the issues are ventilated, the better the chance that stakeholders have a, a, an opportunity to understand the, the complex issues that are at play as it relates um, to cyber security. From all the attempts of regulation and control that I've seen, all of them were completely unaware of how the internet works and that really it would be impossible to do it. So uh, I think it really goes to implement best practices and the best practices are out there. And most of them are easy to adopt, but they don't necessarily have a very quick impact on the, pro on the organization adopting it. And I think this is what is making uh, this best practice not widely adopted, so it's really to move to a point that everyone is doing their own part. And if I would make some recommendations to the stakeholders, uh, I think the first one is there is no single organization, single team, single cert uh, that would be able to make any improvement alone. What we really need is to have uh, teams policymakers and all the sectors in every country in the society aware of the problems and aware of their own roles to make that better and to make the situation better and to improve cooperation where possible and as much as possible uh, being that small groups cooperating a sector and then having someone to be like someone to breach those sectors and there was a lot of those small examples and case studies okay, the on. first time an ITF so, check it would be good to look at those examples, talk to some people that are doing a dif making a difference, and spread that word, you know, that we need to have all sectors involved and then talking to each other and, and create a model that will work. I think there's no model created yet. Uh, the third community is doing a lot of work, but that is just one piece of the puzzle. We need more people involved and more cooperation. agree a lot of uh, what Christine said, but very simply, my recommendation to the stakeholder is treat the cybersecurity as 
a part of improving the global environment, not removing away from moving away from the security mindset to more global environment improvement um, type of mindset. Then we can work together. Really. So with that, there's about I'll, I'll yield a minute back to, to all of you. I'd like to thank first of all. Uh, the panelists for in a very engaging uh, session this morning. I wish to thank um, all of you for some probing questions. Um, for those of you um, in the audience for coming and picking this session as the first one. Um, thank you all and hope to c continue the conversation. Please feel free to speak with others. The hashtag is IGF2013 if you're on Twitter and if not have a very productive conference. Thank you.